The Money Show. Business Books. Time to get into business books now when you're going to be looking at a, a new read that you can pick up. But across all sectors, organizations, fixation and functionality have meant that human elements of the customer experience have become neglected. Now, strict processes and automated procedures throughout companies have created organizations full of people who aren't allowed to act in a human way. So we basically all have been numbers. And this is what the book we're going to be picking up today is going to be addressing the human experience, how to make life better for your customers and create more successful organizations. Of course, the author there, John Seals, we now joined uh, on the line uh, through the business book feature by uh, Bronwyn Williams, the trend translator and future finance specialist at Flux Trends. This is generally uh, a self-help book for those companies that have become too tech and uh, have no human element, isn't it, uh, Bronwyn? Yes, it's really a book for any business that has figured out the, the grand secret that at the end of the day, if you're not making your customers happy, you don't really have a business unless you're fortunate enough to work in like a state-owned enterprise monopoly, but that's a different story for a different day. <laughs> and when you pick up this book uh, and just read through it, I mean, a lot of us complain about being uh, just numbers at work and, you know, no really, really picking up our role because there's this computer that now gets to chat with the customer. Um, how can this book uh, take a st- make, make companies take a step back and, and really value the human uh, effect in businesses? Well, what I thought was great about this book is it really echoes something that I speak about quite a lot in my work with my corporate clients is we really tend to say that when it comes down to it, your margin as a company comes from humans, comes from irrational humans, in fact, and getting some sort of a degree of them to like you more than your competitor. And one of the mistakes we see being made over and over again, particularly as we have all these shiny, new, fantastic automation tools, and now we've got chat GPT that can work out like a a bot overnight to outsource your customer service department, for example, right? Or we can use bots to pre-screen the CVs we get into our HR departments and look at all this efficiency we're getting. What we're forgetting is that the margin is in the human mess and that we are selling to humans. And then if you treat your customers like automatons or like numbers or bots, they are going to treat you essentially in the same way. In other words, the less human your experience is with them, the less leeway they're going to give you when things go wrong. And things always do go wrong. Very similar to the HR recruitment question, right? If you're only hiring people whose CVs fit in exactly with the HR screening bots you're using to pre-screen CVs, you're going to end up with a mediocre company over time, right? Because you're going to end up hiring into the safe middle bell curve of the zone. And the very same thing happens with your customer service. Now, one of the things that John does get into in this book is that, as he says, there's no such thing as customer loyalty. Customers have options, unless, as I mentioned at the beginning, you happen to work in a monopoly industry, which most of us don't. Most of us are running small size businesses or even large ones have to compete for customers. And we're only really as good as our last interaction with those customers. And people remember, science does tell us this, there've been plenty of studies on this, that people remember and will communicate with more people when things go wrong then they will remember yeah. and communicate when things go right because the basic expectation that you should be delivering the service that people are paying for. When things go wrong, they turn into interesting stories. Like I have a, st- a story of one of my friends I've told in many keynotes across many stages, across many continents. And when her father died, sadly, the insurance company sent the deceased father a survey asking how their service was oh, you know, no. dealing with his life insurance claim, which is just incredible. It's like you had to invest money in automating this inhuman process that has done nothing but get people like myself on platforms like your radio station to talk about the company. Now, I'm not going to name and shame them because I know you've also got sponsorship and advertising deals, but it's one of the big household name brand life insurance companies here in South Africa. And I've certainly told many people the story offline where this message is, you know, perpetuates it through time. And John's book is full of fantastic examples too of these needless problems that often ironically come from automating things. That form and that request for a survey my friend and her mother were given while they were grieving was an automated system. It was done to try and increase efficiency and increase return on investment, but it actually ended up doing exactly the opposite. And this is a great point that John makes in the book once again, that the cost of delivering bad service is actually high in and of itself. 
Like he has great examples there too of just inefficiency of like buying a car and getting three different letters from three different departments on the same day, all giving him a small piece of information about how his product is supposed to work and how his payments are going to work in the future. Needlessly inefficient. They actually very paid confusing. money to make that customer experience worse, right? So it's like it's not just the cost of potentially losing a customer, the cost of actually delivering bad experience through automating a bad bot, through designing a bad system, has a real and material impact on your bottom line. And what does John Sills then say about having the balance? I mean, a company that I can think of, think mm. of is the e-commerce giant Amazon. You know, automation, hundred yeah. percent, one of the best leaders in the world in terms of that delivering on time. Uh, on the same day but when things go wrong you know and you're not happy with the package you know those sort of companies should still have the human on the other side to pick up the phone and either apologize to the customer or reset the process so is it still a great balance that's still to be done by these companies yeah exactly so so Amazon actually pops up as one of the examples in the book too and and, you know Jeff Bezos made it very clear in the beginning that Amazon's mandate was focused on the things that aren't going to change the people are always going to want right we're always going to want things delivered fast and we're always going to want things to be cheap and they've optimized their process for that so he explains how in that case if you if you do have a return for a company like amazon they will refund you instantaneously they won't wait and make you go through a multi-month process we've all been there right where our companies overcharged us or sent us the wrong thing and yet we've had to follow up with their accounts department multiple times in order to get our own money refunded to us. If you just fire up Twitter and any given day, you'll see people complaining about how quick companies are to take them, take your money, but how slow they are to correct things when things go, go wrong. And Amazon's built its brand largely on doing that, on automating things that will reduce the need for human intervention. In other words, they've optimized on not making mistakes in the first place or preempting those mistakes, which is a way to get a balance between automation and humanity. Now, when things do go wrong and the automated processes do break down, the point John makes then very clearly is that you have to have a human in the loop that's actually able to solve that problem for your customer. We've all been in that case where you've picked up a phone to a call center, gone through some horrendous call music for many hours, maybe dropped the call a couple of times and finally got through to someone who basically says, computer says, no, that's not my job, call this other number, right? Or gives you an answer that was available on the website that's not actually helpful (laughs) to your case. So the best companies, when it comes to customer service, empower the employees to have a degree of discretion that only a human can have in order to solve that problem. So it comes back to the point that, again, I make quite a lot with our corporate clients, which is, leave human jobs to humans and robot jobs to robots, right? So if you're automating things so that they don't go wrong, like using the Amazon model, you then free up your human resources to actually deal with solving humans' problems, which are nuanced, which don't fit neatly into a GPT chat automated flow. It's the exceptions that you want exceptional people to deal with. And that's great news for both employees who have now a more interesting job with more satisfaction because you're actually solving people's problems so you can go to the office and actually feel like you've done something with your day. And it's better for your customers, right? So trying to separate what can be automated and what should not be automated is one of the first things you should be asking yourself in any sort of digital transformation process that you're going through in your organization. I tell you what, Bronwyn, this has given me a, quite a bit of hope by this particular book. I think a lot of companies should be picking this up, especially in the C-suite. The human experience, how to make life better for your customers and create more successful organizations. And that book by John Sills and basically John Sills saying... Even with AI and all this great technology that's coming, there's still space for the human employee to connect with your customers. Of course, that was our business book feature with Bronwyn Williams, the trend translator and future finance specialist at Flux Trends.